how's everybody doing? Um, it's really been very interesting and I think also useful for me to start to start to see all the different ways that the things that we draw from Mary Jo's work, they have these sort of connections, um, even though they're distinct unto themselves, there's still something that's related. And um, a lot of what <clears throat> Cassie has said has resonated with some of the things that um, I think that I find most valuable in what I pull from Mary Jo's work as well, too, um, in terms of desire. I don't know where I'm looking for Cassie and I can't find her. <laughs> oh, hey, all right. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, in terms of desire, in terms of intimacy or a lack thereof, in terms of ruin and construction or deconstruction. Um, and so I'm going to read four poems. Um, and I think the through thread has something to do with all of those. But also, I was thinking also, too, about how these poems, hopefully this will be evident, but I think that they voice something about the conundrum of what it means to be seen and to recognize yourself as being seen. And that has to do something, I think, with these, these speakers in these poems that, um, that draw from history, as we know, in Adolfo Throwing, um, or in other poems that sort of um, embody these speakers that, that, that the speaker is both Mary Jo and, and, and something that lives beyond it. And I, to me, that's something that I aspire to in my own poems as well. Um, I have an order to this. The first poem I'm going to read is called The Human Figure in a Dress. Naked or not, I'm a costume that moves, figurine with a face that changes. You could call me a mood. I begin cheerful, but sometimes turn solemn when confronted with my own mythology. Wolf in a cape, cat claw scratch on a cupboard door, mouse tail in the hand of a bland farmer's wife, a drop of blood on her shoe. Today's beginning ended in a dream. In a fantastical bed, a lover leaned in to a kiss. A lover leaned in to kiss me just as I realized I was part machine, part primitive urge. I left the bed and said, you know, don't you? Not everyone is so disposed. And then I heard from inside my head, you should say, not everyone is so disposed to your utopia. Only then did I realize I'd been inexact. Even here, there are scolds that tell you how to be. Sometimes they live inside. Naked or not, I am trying to tuck my arms invisibly behind my back so that all you can see are my breasts and my highly simplified head. Long exposure photograph of a man. One man is many. I never said he left me, but he left what he thought I was. Yes, and I too had thoughts that went on over time. Duration extends into the future, wraps around the past. Can anyone avoid saying, I once was? Of course, now you have those test tube babies, your nuclear transfer animals. My brother was at one point making a film that moved forward while we stood still. Looking isn't always gawking. That requires a degree of stumbling, open mouth wonder. What's wrong with that? If you had seen what I had seen, my brother is reading Kafka, my brother Franz, an incidental doubling. I told you before that I spoke English, or did I? You know it now. You also should know that I communicate through showing how an object acts on me. I'm either in it or I'm behind it, one or two or more. Will you someday really bring everything back from the brink? Another poem that I come back to is from the last two seconds. It's called Costumes Exchanging Glances. The rhinestone lights blink off and on. Pretend stars. I'm sick of explanations. A life is like Russell said of electricity. Not a thing, but the way things behave. A science of motion towards some flat surface, some heat, some cold. Some light can leave some after image, but it doesn't last. Isn't that what they say? That and that historical events exchange glances with nothingness. And this last poem that I'll read is called Catastrophe Theory 3, um, and it's from The Eye Like a Strange Balloon. 
Now we sit and play with a tiny toy elephant that travels a taut string. Now we are used and use in turn each other. Our hats unravel, and that in itself is tragic. To be lost, to have lost. Verbs like veritable engines pulling the train of thought forward. The hat is over, turned, and out comes a rabbit. Out comes a man with a monocle. Out comes a Kaiser. Yikes, it's history, that ceiling comprised of recessed squares, each leg a lifeline, each lie a wife's leg. A pulled velvet cord rings a bell, and everyone comes running to watch while a year plummets into the countdown of an open mouth. A loop of razor wire closes around the circumference of a shaking globe of snow. Yellowed newsprint with its watery text a latticework of shadow thrown onto the clear screen of the prison wall. From a mere idea comes the twine that gives totality its name. What is a theory but a tentacle reaching for a wafer of reason? The inevitable gap, tragic. Sure, tragic. Thanks so much, Mark, for kicking us rock, kicking us off right that way. Um, and thank you, Joel, and everyone in Special Collections for this uh, opportunity to, to talk about Mary Jo's influence and her work. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit more extemporaneously about my experience of being her student, and um, also that word mentor too, and sort of sort of making it my own. Um, but I I was putting together some notes for sort of thinking about maybe one of the things that I've taken away from Mary Jo. Um, and I think it's most ca encapsulated in this. I think that in her own particular way, Mary Jo always emphasized that this act of writing is, in one way or another, deeply intertwined with the idea of community. Um, and in an unexpected way, because that word gets tossed around, tossed around a lot. Despite the often solitary act of writing, the text we engage with via formal devices like erasure, erasure or via the ever-evolving traditions within language, Mary Jo made it clear that we are in conversation with one another. There seemed to me something sacred about this. There is this value to this work that not only for how it allows us the opportunity to plumb our own minds and challenge ourselves, but also because of the way it connects us to an ancient human tradition of language, of association, of interpretation. Mary Jo helped us deeply consider the workings of a mind, our own, and the broader strangeness of all human ones. And for me, to talk about that philosophically, I want to step back and go to a memorable moment that was my first workshop in my first year. Um, and for some reason at the time, all of us uh, in workshop, and I don't know if I see like a cluster of people that are currently in workshop now in the back. I don't know if this was the fashion of the time, but um, we were just writing our initials on the poems rather than our full names. And I think we've talked about this, Mary Jo. Um, and so I had the initials that coincided with someone who was a second year in the program at the same time. Um, and I had to turn in a poem that day. And Mary Jo, went into the poem and deconstructed it, saying that she was thinking about it as if it were the poem, a poem of a second year student who had, been, who had a year of being under her tutelage in a particular way. Um, and there was a particular precision and incisiveness in a way that was really an all, in a, all in one swoop sort of showing me a new language for how to talk about what a poem is as a made object. Um, and after the fact, when uh, we realized that the poem was actually mine as a first year, not the second year. Mary Jo was a little bit apologetic, like, oh, was that too rough? Was that, you know, um, <laughs> was that, you know, didn't want to sort of blow my socks off in my first day in workshop, which is another sort of, uh, you know, um, which is another kind of a particular, a, a subtle compassion um, to show to a, to a brand new student that was sort of broad and wide-eyed uh, in my first weeks here on campus. Um, but it, it was, it was, for me, it was useful because it sort of showed me the seriousness and the sincerity that Mary Jo brought to everything that was brought into workshop. And it's something that I hope that I carry both as a 
educator now, but also as a scholar and working my PhD here, and also as a poet always. Um, so for me, it was really a valuable experience in, in terms of the sincerity that's behind this and what is really at stake when we're writing poems. Um, so that, from that sort of moment of kind of shock in that first workshop, in that same session, I remember Mary Jo saying that anybody who wants to meet with me as often as you'd like, you can come by. Um, and you know, and I don't know how folks uh, took advantage of that, but um, I was there every week, I think. I was always saying I'd like to make an appointment and have some one-on-one -on -one time. Um, and for one reason or another at that moment, I sort of, I guess I sensed the fact that um, you know, the opportunities for workshop are fleeting and that the whole time of the MFA is over before you know it. But it was, I think that there was something that I was immediately sort of magnetically drawn to that was this, um, this sincerity and this attention to everything that can happen in a poem. And uh, every time that I brought something in, it was about, it wasn't just about what the poem said and the poem's potential, but it was also about, again, engaging in this human tradition of what people have been doing via language for as long as there has been language. Um, and so for me, I, when I think about sort of putting language to the seriousness that I, that I bring to my craft now, I know it's because Mary Jo was one of the people that really instilled that in me. Um, so I'm eternally grateful for that. And I think that I'm probably still learning for that, from that as well, too. Um, and all of this, as I was sort of thinking this through, realized that it uh, sounds so much to me like Eliot's essay, um, Tradition and the Individual Talent, and sort of having that sort of mindset. And then I realized that Mary Jo was also the person that put that essay in my hands. So, so um, it's, it's, for me, I feel like it's a, our relationship, which is still obviously ongoing, thankfully, is, is something that I'm continuing to learn from in terms of what's at stake in language um, when we write poems. Um, and then aside from that, another sort of student type anecdote was, I remember maybe, I think it was that same fall, later that fall, Mary Jo had an exhibition at um, the, the now defunct but still famous Fort Gondo um, that was of her art. And um, I remember walking in and feeling like there is an opportunity to do more, you know, whatever our creativity, our creativity might manifest in whatever number of ways, and there's no reason for us to sort of shunt it off into one creative language. And I started to see, for me, seeing Mary Jo's artwork, I still felt the same sort of, I don't want to say tone, but the same sort of sensibility and sensitivity that I sense in the poems themselves. And for me, that was exciting because it, it sort of, for me, helped me to um, recognize the opportunity to let my creative uh, expression take whatever form it wants to take. Um, and since then, a poet that I've been paying attention to in the same way, and I think that this is, you know, maybe this is the comparative uh, literature PhD thing going off in my head, but I've been thinking about um, that same element in Terence Hayes's work. Um, and how he's also a visual artist that is um, sort of in conversation with his own poetry. Um, and so that to me seems like a really um, a dynamic and fruitful way to, to go about thinking about what, um, what one's art can be. Um, so I'm very grateful for that. Um, and then the third sort of teacherly um, element that is still something that's reverberating for me is again translation as we talked about it. Trans translation is something um, that is at the crux of, of, of what I'm doing right now and I'm not sure that I would have necessarily seen the metaphorical potential of, of, a, of, a, of translation as a broader project had I not been a student here while Mary Jo was finishing um, the Inferno. Um, and for me, it's, it's valuable to think about. I, I remember one of, another one of the sessions where Mary Jo was talking about all the different English translations that she was sort of uh, engaging, reflecting on, resisting, um, complicating, as she was doing her own translation in preparing the Inferno for our contemporary moment. And um, that's something that I'm thinking about now as I work on translating um, Nicolas Guillen, who is this Afro-Cuban poet. So there are these strains of 
um, the teacher who brings a, a seriousness and a sensitivity and a sincerity to, to, the, to the act of mentoring, to the act of workshop, to the act of um, revising poetry. Then there's the um, level of artistic expression that goes beyond what we might assume a, po a, poem, a poet is allowed to do, rather uh, that a poet can manifest their self-expression in whatever way it manifests, visual art in Mary Jo's case, in one of Mary Jo's cases. And then third, translation, which is something uh, that, particularly in a, in a US American context, tends to be something that we tend to forget, the richness of, of, of language, of what's happening in literary language outside of English. Um, so in all those ways, I'm indebted to, to Mary Jo um, and ongoingly learning from, from what she's, she's doing. So I'm very grateful in those ways, and um, I'm looking forward to um, hearing what other folks have to say, and I'm very excited to, um, to talk about, so, to share some of her poems later. So thank you. Thank you.